Hello, Internet. So today, because the Internet is so devoid of people with opinions on things, I thought that maybe I could help out with that and deliver some opinions. Um, and in this case, uh, I know that I, in the past, I've talked about philosophy. Here, I'm just going to be talking a little bit about Star Trek because it is a series that over much of my life, it's been just one of those pieces of fiction that sticks in, in my head. It's not necessarily that, um, it's not the only thing that's stuck in my head. Like, uh, I grew up with Doctor Who, and to a certain extent, I, I've occasionally thought about that, but it's diminished over the years. Um, particularly because with Doctor Who, I found that the newer series just didn't work for me. I didn't. So let's talk a little bit about canon before we get started. And I define canon as the version of a story that a person or group keeps in their head. And so different canons exist. Not everybody's going to agree on canons. An individual might even see multiple canons as existing in their head in some form. And, and sometimes you even have websites like Memory Alpha and Memory Beta, both pretty well known by the Trek community for being databases for different notions of canon. If I remember correctly, Memory Alpha is trying to be stuff that has made it into relatively uh, commercial uh, video uh, with all the legal rights holders and all that, and Memory Beta is seen as being the bigger work of uh, of the novels, of, of the books. I don't remember quite if it's, if any of the books make it into Memory Alpha or not, but Memory Beta is really more the expanded universe. And, and an individual could have a notion, this is my narrow canon, this is my wide canon. Um, and there's a lot of precedents in this, like even in religion, you could have like Christian tales of Jesus are generally going to be non-canon for people following Judaism and only semi-canonical for uh, people following Islam. Star Control 3 is often considered non-canon by fans of the series. Um, and I actually disagree with this one. I actually rather like Star Control 3 and I thought it was a reasonable expansion of the Star Control universe. Um, but I, I recognize that there, there might be okay reasons to consider it uh, non-canon. I think it was made without much involvement or maybe no involvement at all of the um, original series authors. And that, that that's that's at least one good reason to, to break with canon or to break with commercial canon if, if you're gonna do that. Um, and see, yeah, I'm just moving windows around because I'm realizing that my notes should probably be on the same computer as the one with the web, uh, webcam on it that I'm talking into. Um, you also have the Metal Gear games that I suspect that people will consider the ones not made by Kojima to be non-canon. Um, and uh, with, with Doctor Who, because I mentioned it earlier, um, Doctor Who is a series where a lot of us decided that the movie was non-canon. And for some of us, we stuck with that and we consider everything following the movie to be non-canon. So we see there to be seven, uh, seven main doctors plus the Valyard. Um, uh, and so we consider Sylve Sylvester McCoy, the seventh doctor to still be the uh, canonical doctor and the canon to be largely closed for commercial purposes. And so I, I don't see anything after that uh, in the commercial series as being really part of Doctor Who. I see it as being part of a remake. And I know a lot of people might disagree. They might really like the, the remake Doctors, but um, again, we all get to decide what version of stories live in our head. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of reasons why people can br might break from commercial canon or from a community's canon. Uh, they might decide that original writers uh, being gone makes a difference. They might just see some really bad writing. Th they might see some weird activism inserted into stories. Um, 
like Marvel has done this a lot. Uh, but whatever, canon is a personal choice and we all get to choose what version of a story lives in our head and that's cool. Anyhow, Star Trek. We were, uh, I started this by um, saying that I, I had some comments on each of the series of Star Trek. And before I do that, I will briefly mention that there are some movies that I, uh, that I also don't consider uh, canon. I think they're called the Kelvin series and they're, they do weird things with, uh, they reimagine the Klingons with a really bizarre look. And I realize that Klingons have not had a consistent appearance across Star Trek. Um, I, I'm willing to accept that fudge, but the reworking done as part of the recent movies uh, it seems gratuitous and stupid to me. And so I, I reject those films. Also, I just, I have a tough time seeing, I'm generally not very accepting of getting a different actor to play a role. And so just seeing Spock and Kirk and so on recast, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, the, the, it is not those characters, or at least, I mean, to me. Uh, and so I'm not particularly interested in, I just, there's too much. There's too much that I, I find to be annoying, and so I'm not not really going with that. Um, so the Kelvin series movies are not part of what I consider canon. So let's start with the original series. And I grew up with reruns of the original series. Um, I was born near the end of the 70s, and so the original series was all wrapped up by the time that, uh, that, uh, that I... Uh, that I was born much less by the time I was uh, starting to watch TV and take in work, works of fiction. But the original series was very popular, lots and lots of reruns. And I'm guessing that I've probably seen most, maybe even close to all of the original series um, over the years. And it established the formula for the early Star Trek series as being the Twilight Zone in space. Um, it's very serial. You have a thought experiment and you use the show as kind of a vehicle to deal with a thought experiment. Oh, here's a novel situation. How are they going to resolve it in 30 minutes or 20 minutes if you figure in ad time? And uh, sometimes there's a moral lesson. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just, oh, that's a quirky idea. How can we explore it a little bit? And that's what the original series was. And while it had its share of stinkers, like Spock's brain, uh, which is like entertainingly bad, really, really bad, but the formula worked as a whole. And it's nice that the writers spread their attention reasonably well across all the characters. Um, and so the original series, it's a classic. And uh, the, the movies that followed after it were mostly pretty good. There were some stupid things in each of them. Uh, some of them, like I, I kind of care about having continuity in canon and, and uh, traveling to the center of the galaxy was not, uh, it didn't really make sense in, in that movie. But in general, the original series and its movies were good film, uh, were, uh, they were good fiction uh, for that formula. And it's nice that the formula got established. It gave a lot of stuff for the rest of Star Trek to play off. Um, but, uh, but let's move on briefly to The Cage, which was the original pilot for uh, the original series. And it was kind of a discarded prototype. Um, they later on did some stuff with the footage. But let's talk about it as an original episode, because I think it was great. It might have even... It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if they had gone with the original pilot, because in, I think for many of the characters, I liked the the pilot version a little bit more. Uh, we didn't really get to see how it would have uh, gone, and there there were some improvements in the move from the cage to the proper original series. It's nice that they fleshed out the Vulcans. The way Spock behaves in the cage makes a lot less sense given later continuity. Uh, and I think the continuity improvements around the Vulcans are great uh, in the move to the original series, but a lot of the other characters were pretty compelling. Um, 
take almost any character from the cage, and I would have loved to have seen a lot more of them. Uh, Yeoman Colt would have been interesting to see. Uh, Pike was interesting. Uh, the Doctor guy, who ended up being a fair bit like McCoy, um, but maybe a little more cozy. Um, it, it, but yeah, the, the cage was really great. If you haven't ever seen it, it's the original pilot to the original series. Go track it down. Uh, it is worth your time. Um, after the original series was the animated series. And I saw this as a kid too, but just a bit. Um, it didn't get as many reruns and I just wasn't as interested. Somehow it just didn't feel as compelling as the original series or the many other things that were on TV. It was a very inconsistent quality. It had room to be more imaginative because of the medium, and I really appreciated that. They could show non-human cast members a lot more, uh, and they didn't have to look like Klingons did in the original series, which is basically like Klingons, I think they were heavily patterned after Mongolians and Mongolian culture. And that was it's a little weird to see that today. It's nice that a lot of later characterization has uh, has improved that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the animated series, it was a fine c continuation of the original series. It didn't step very far outside the bounds, but it was very, very inconsistent in quality. Then there was The Next Generation, which was really the first time that I was seeing new episodes live of Star Trek. And that was pretty cool. It was a little bit more intellectual than the original series, but still followed the formula pretty tightly. But it did get better as time went on and as Roddenberry's influence diminished. Um, my thoughts on Roddenberry are very complex. Uh, I'm glad that he gave the series a start. I think some of his vision was deeply flawed. Um, but I, I'm appreciative that he, he, he showed up and got, uh, got the series started. Um, I, I think character development was a real strength of the next generation. The original series didn't have a lot of character development. It, it talked as if it did. Like there was a lot of talk about this developing friendship between Kirk and Spock and McCoy and, and this three-way relationship but it wasn't really visibly developed. You go back and watch early episodes and later episodes, and it's not particularly different, uh, and that's kind of dis disappointing. With the original series, you saw each character develop depth. I mean, there was also revealed depth, but there was development of depth, and that was nice. Like you saw, if you think about Riker, who was um, uh, first officer Riker, uh, really, he changed a lot over the series, and uh, and you'd see him develop this kind, uh, this weird commingling of professional and personal relationships with everybody. And there were some episodes where they had a a captain. What was his name? Captain uh, Belaros, or don't quite remember. Uh, they, they had another captain, um, and it was clear that, that Riker was much better suited to work with Picard, but, but he had, there was that, uh, the comfort that had slowly been developing over the years was suddenly gone. You also saw Riker's interesting relationship to one of his prior captains in one of the more interesting later episodes, because TNG, it slowly began to poke at ideas of correction and imperfection in the Federation itself. As the series went on, it never became a major theme in The Next Generation. And The Next Generation was almost strictly uh, serial, except near the end of a series when all the really good, interesting, longer term episodes uh, happened. But yeah, TNG, I think it took the formula of the original series into maturity and it did it well. And I love that the, uh, that the writers, they explored all the characters really well. You saw some bit characters um, like O'Brien actually become kind of important and interesting uh, over time. I don't think he even originally had a name. And then we hit Deep Space Nine. Uh, 
and I consider Deep Space Nine to be the best of Star Trek, despite some flaws. The, the pilot was great. The first two series were mostly not particularly good, but starting in series uh, in season three, it became a model for how Trek should be and a big change in direction from uh, the Roddenberry slash serialized world. The, the characters were much more complex. There was politics. There were societies with deep differences in their values. There was intrigue. And there was eventually real moral depth. In the Pale Moonlight is, in my view, one of the finest pieces of science fiction made. There were a few mistakes. Dukat's evolution near the end of the series made him far less interesting of a character. Dax's death and replacement was a really poor choice. The baseball episode never should have happened. But Deep Space Nine it demonstrated that Star Trek was improved by using Roddenberry's ideas as a launching pad rather than walls. And um, it, it's hard to top, uh, hard to top Deep Space Nine. Um, and then came Voyager, and Voyager overlapped with Deep Space Nine a little bit, just like Deep, S Deep Space Nine overlapped with the end of The Next Generation. Voyager was a compromise, I think, between Deep Space Nine and The Next Generation in terms of how episodes were structured. It had a really solid premise, but highly inconsistent and generally bad writing. It wasted a lot of its characters by focusing too much on particular characters, initially Kess, and then later, Seven. And by the end of The Next Generation, you generally knew a lot about most of the characters you saw, including particularly Riker. Uh, by the end of Deep Space Nine, you knew a lot about everybody. Uh, but by the end of Voyager, we still hardly knew First Officer Chakotay or most of the rest of the bridge crew. Um, it, was, it just mostly was the Kess show for a certain length of time. And then it became, uh, and and uh, and then it became the Seven show. And that should uh, shouldn't have been allowed to happen. They they the Voyagers writers really dropped the ball. Or whoever approved scripts didn't do a good enough job at saying no 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 uh, to a lot of the really bad ideas. After Voyager was Enterprise, uh, which I didn't see. Um, I was a little bit. Uh, I, my life became rather busy and I didn't have a lot of time or attention for Star Trek for a while. And also, I had uh, I had Scott Bakula stuck in my head as Sam Beckett from Quantum Leap, and I had a hard time imagining him as anything else. I probably am ready to, <laughs> to stop doing that now, um, but, uh, but I really haven't seen much of Enterprise, apart from a few clips. I don't have any opinions on its canonicity yet, but so far, everything I've mentioned, apart from Enterprise, where I don't have an opinion, I, I consider it canon. Let's talk about Star Trek Discovery. I wanted to like it, and this was like the first Star Trek that I tried to give a chance in a long time, but what little I've seen was mostly terrible. There's dumb made-up plot ideas like The Burn, that are like some alien person screams and somehow destroys uh, a um, destroys dilithium across the entire universe. Like, it doesn't make sense. Really stupid. Uh, stop it. It uh, rewards awful characters who have been jammed into continuity with the subtlety of a garbage truck at a car show, like Burnham. Uh, cinematography is really interested in showing people squee at things, which... I, I always find super infuriating, like uh, turn off the TV and go take a walk, irritating. I don't like seeing people squee and the series seems to have a thing for it. Um, and it's just, it's mostly shit that feels like a bad fanfic. Uh, there's also way too much fan service, not of the sexy kind. Um, there are a few bright points in the series. Uh, Michelle Yeoh's character, uh, is really interesting, and uh, Cronenberg as Kovic is great. All of his uh, scenes are are really great. Uh, I've made, but I've mostly seen those through clips. Uh, I I just consider Star Trek Discovery to be non-canon. I recommend avoiding it. Do not consider it part of Star Trek. Uh, a race. 
next, uh, and I'm getting a little bit out of order, um, the Star Trek Picard. I wasn't sure if I'd see myself getting back into Star Trek after having considered a closed door since Voyager and having seen uh, Discovery to be such a train wreck. But Picard is well done. It mixes mostly the Deep Space Nine type flavoring, maybe a little bit more action oriented. It's not sedate in any way. Uh, the action is pretty common and frequent, uh, but it has various strong philosophical themes, how we find meaning in life, um, interpretations of history. Um, it's uh, how we age. Um, I've only seen season one so far because um, unfortunately Paramount, uh, they're really trying to push people towards subscribing to their streaming services and I'm not willing to do that. But uh, I consider it uh, rather good. And so far I'm considering it canon. And I, I, I really like that Picard is not portrayed as an unflawed person, as a moral paragon or anything like that. Um, and the ship captain with his holograms is surprisingly adorable, but really most of the characters are quite interesting. And that's, that's cool. I, I, I hope that they get some more characterization. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, Picard is, is good so far. Uh, and again, my notion is so far is season one. Um, I'm trying to avoid seeing anything uh, of season two until I can buy the whole thing and watch it at the pace I want. Next, there's Star Trek Lower Decks, which is a comic relief take on Star Trek. And if you accept it as that and like that idea, then it's pretty decent. It could be improved by working a little bit more on the humor, um, possibly toning it and the characters down a little bit and anti-flanderizing them. They don't have a lot of depth and their antics are a little actually a lot over the top um but uh but i mean that would change what it is maybe some later seasons will improve on some of these points and again with lower decks i've only seen season one same reason uh, i don't consider lower decks to be canon but i do consider it worth watching um if i did consider it to be a candidate for canon which i'm really not then i would wish it had less fan service Basically of the type that uh, we need to portray the center of older stories as being the most important stuff that ever happened. Uh, like um, like O'Brien, for example. Really great character from The Next Generation, and in particular Deep Space Nine. Got a lot of really great depth. Um, Lower Decks has a statue of him as, I think, the most important person in history or Starfleet or something like that. And generally, they like to put main characters from past series front and center in a way that just doesn't seem possibly realistic. Star Trek probably should be full of interesting stories. And the fact that the series followed the people that it did should be seen as just an accident of framing rather than... Uh, these are the only interesting people that have ever existed in the Star Trek world. That So that bugs me, but it doesn't bother me so much in Lower Decks um, because, again, it's uh, I don't really consider it to be candidate to be considered canon. Um, it is jokes and fan service and kind of laughing at the edges of Star Trek. It, it is okay to me that Lower Decks is kind of a fanfic. But, I, but I'm not trying to evaluate it on the standard of being anything more than that. And then there's Star Trek Prodigy. I haven't seen a lot of it. From what little I've seen, it's your generic children's sci-fi show that got a little bit of Star Trek flavoring poured over it at the last minute. Uh, it's not doesn't have really any of the flavor of Star Trek. Uh, Non-canon, avoid. So those are my thoughts on the Star Trek series and a little bit on the Star Trek movies. Um, I, and I guess in theory, maybe in another 20 years, if I'm still making stuff on YouTube, I might do this again and have some other things to add to it. But I think, I, I don't think I've missed anything. I've heard rumors of other series that will be coming off some, one rumor I've heard, uh, it might not 
even still be a rumor. Maybe it's a thing or maybe it's canceled. But one rumor was a Star Trek series just focused on short stories um, set in the Star Trek universe, but not trying to establish a, a new long-term series with long-term characters. Another that I've heard about is possibly doing a series that would be fo uh, focused on um, on the characters from the cage. And that sounds potentially interesting, although I generally don't like to see recasts of past characters with a different actor. I just, I cannot get used to that um, other guy playing Spock or the other guy playing Kirk. They don't look like that. It just looks wrong to me. But maybe, uh, maybe they'll, maybe these things will work out. And if they manage to really find people who look almost identical, then maybe maybe it will work out. I think I've seen even some uh, some stills of somebody playing Captain Pike uh, from uh, the, the Cage and um, see somebody new playing him, and they actually somehow managed to find somebody who just so happens to look a whole lot like the original actor. So if if that works out, uh, great. But it just it's very hard to find people who are dead ringers or even reasonably close. Um, and yeah, but that those are my thoughts on Star Trek as it is right now. Um, if you have any comments, uh, I might end up responding as text. Uh, if you have any ideas on things you would like to see me cover, Star Trek, philosophy, current events, whatever, um, you can leave those in the comments. And maybe if it seems like a good idea to me, then I'll, I'll do that. I'm hoping the audio qualities on this is uh, okay. It's been a while since I've um, done a recording. Bye-bye.